Good afternoon. Welcome to B-Sides Las Vegas Day 2, Ground Truth. And today we have Jonathan Lustas with Playing Games with Cyber Criminals. Before we get started, I've got a couple of announcements. We'd like to thank our sponsors, especially our diamond sponsor, Adobe, and our gold sponsors, Plextrack, Toyota, and Conductor One. It's their support, along with our other sponsors, donors, and volunteers, that make this event possible. Uh, these talks are being streamed live, and as a courtesy to our speakers and the audience, we'd ask that you check to make sure your cell phone is on silent or do not disturb. If there is time for questions at the end, I have a microphone in the middle there, and uh, we'll see how uh, whether you go up to get it or I'll, I'll bring it to you. Uh, I'll plan to, if there are questions, go get the mic and I'll bring it to you. And with no further ado, Jonathan. Well, it's a privilege to present this research to you. Uh, before I start, though, I just want to acknowledge quite clearly that this is a team effort. Uh, so I'm presenting this research today. I'm the, the PI on the project. Uh, but there's uh, a number of others involved here. Uh, so we have co-authors in Eduardo Gallo and Federico Varese. But particularly, I want to note uh, the contribution of Rebecca Heath, uh, who's done a huge amount of work for, the, for this project. So it's by no means uh, myself presenting uh, on behalf of myself. This is very much a, a team effort. Now, what I'm going to talk to you today might be slightly weird as a type of presentation uh, for a few different reasons. One, you'd note there's an Oxford-Cambridge collaboration, which we're meant to be sworn enemies, so that's quite unusual. But there's no, there's no serious beef there, and you, know, you want to work with good people, so we managed to do that. So that, that seems a little bit weird, but it's not that weird. Uh, secondly, this is a very social science-y type of presentation, which might be a bit weird if you don't come from a, a social science type of background. And particularly, I'm a sociologist, but I'm drawing on another field, which is experimental economics, and so the collaborators we have have brought us into that space. So I'll try and be a little bit gentle with that. I had to learn that myself. Uh, so I'll be quite clear in, in those sorts of elements because it gets a little bit technical in its own kind of way. Uh, but the third part that's weird, which is I think the most interesting thing about this, is that if you look at conventional economics, a lot of this is about how do you make markets work more efficiently and more effectively. And the weird thing we're doing in this presentation is actually trying to think about how to make markets work less well. So how do we screw them up? Uh, how do we disrupt them? How do we make them less efficient? So we're doing the opposite of what economists, conventional economists, would be trying to do. Now, why would you want to do that? And the reason for that is not all markets are good. So we have bad markets or markets that we don't want to function so efficiently because they create harm of, of different kinds. So cyber criminal markets, which are the inspiration for this project, uh, fall into that category uh, very much. And so they've really inspired the work that we're doing here. That's the background that I come from as, as a sociologist. I spent a long time interviewing former cyber criminals, interviewing people in industry and law enforcement, trying to understand more about that industry, that criminal industry. And so here I'm talking to you about this one particular part, which is the markets, which are very, very important to how cybercrime functions. So as we all know, cybercrime is a major burden for, for business. It causes a lot of trouble for, for a lot of people. But what is really quite central to this industry is markets, because they allow people who do things like breaches or carry out other types of activities to monetize the data or to engage with others with different types of specialties from the ones that they have. So this is very important to finding friends who can do things that you can't do, right? Working with other people who have specialties and skill sets that you just don't have. And so the markets are very, very essential to this. And they operate in different ways. We get very small ones, and we get large ones that are you know, thousands of members in them. Uh, and they range from those that specialize in certain types of areas, certain types of cybercrime to others that are more general, some that are into more drugs and things like this, we get a whole kind of spectrum. But the essence there is you need a place to trade, to do business, to work together. So looking at the disruption of these markets is actually very valuable as a, as a policy exercise and as a broader exercise in trying to understand how these markets work and how we can make them work uh, less efficiently. So we can think about that. So just as an example, some of you might be familiar with this. This is a kind of historical case now, dark code, uh, quite a few years back now. But just as an example, if you're not familiar with some cyber criminal markets, what they look like, and they look quite similar to a whole bunch of other sites, to be quite honest. We often look for things that are very unusual, very innovative in cybercrime, and they're not in a lot of instances. They use a lot of things we see in other aspects of life, other aspects of tech. Even the, the software that they use to create the sites is very similar to all other sites. So here what we have, dark code, you can see the, the little tagline there about being a marketplace for sewing machines and other stuff. The other stuff is like malware, uh, exploit kits, all sorts of things. Uh, this was known before it was shut down as being a more high-end, more technical kind of English language site. So we get other sites that specialize more in carding, credit card fraud, things like this. 
this had a little bit of stuff going on like that, but it was known as being at the more technical end, at least in the English language uh, scene. And so that was the place that you went as that type of actor of where you wanted to find the, the good stuff in terms of, of malware. So you can see a little bit of a spread uh, of some of the things that were on offer in this particular marketplace. So this is just an example. Again, posts look like what posts look like. Uh, they're not anything particularly special. What we have here, I'm not expecting you to read all this tiny writing, is just an example of, of what we see in these types of markets. And here what we have is one particular cyber criminal under the name uh, JP Morgan, which I think is a fantastic uh, cyber criminal name. And actually, it was very, very uh, effective and well-known cyber criminal. Eastern European actor, uh, very, very important uh, cyber criminal in a number of respects. And he's looking to buy exploits. That's what he's posting about. So he wants people to come and, and do business with him. The key here, how do these markets work? A lot of them work quite simply like this, which is you advertise. Often you're selling or you're advertising to buy, and you'll find partners that way. Some of them evolve to work in slightly different ways, but that's the core of it. You advertise, you're looking for someone to, to trade with, and then you trade. That's as simple as that. Trust is a key component here. So we see a couple of people jumping in in this thread, basically verifying JP Morgan as being a serious person. Uh, we can see down there near the bottom, Paunch, who's another uh, big Russian-speaking cyber criminal, was arrested in Russia a few years back who basically comes in and says, yeah, I know this person. He's, he's very legit. So trust is important, and that's very important to, to trading in these types of settings. So as a social scientist, what I really want to emphasize here is the people involved, that we're talking about people. So we see on the left, there's probably the, the most widely used image of cybercrime that's in any kind of report that you might see. Uh, and so I'm including it here, not as an endorsement, but actually to criticize it a little bit, uh, which is the main problem is that they all have faces. Uh, and this image does not depict that. So on the right, we have a, a real world uh, cyber criminal. It's tied back to that, uh, to that dark code example I just used, which is this was one of the administrators of dark code. So his nickname is Asserto, and he's been arrested multiple times now. So he was also known for being one of the, the key people involved in the Mariposa botnet, uh, and he went on to do a bunch of other stuff. You can see him there wearing a t-shirt because he, after his first arrest, went on to work for a startup in crypto mining. Uh, and so you can see, actually, even just in that case, a little bit of what we're talking about here, that there is actually a strong similarity between some of these actors and regular humans uh, across, you know, these are people. That's the point I like to make. These are people too. Uh, they're not so unique and so unusual that we sort of think, oh, let's reinvent the wheel. Let's think about them in a completely unusual way. No, they're 99% they're like other people, and they're 99.9% .9 like other people in tech uh, because that's, you know, their skill set. And so we often see some individuals who are moving between spaces, sometimes in gray areas, sometimes moving between legitimate enterprises, and more criminal ones. So here the point is that if we're trying to understand more about these types of people, uh, we can look at them through the lens, and as I said, I'm a social scientist, of studying humans. Uh, we don't have to view it purely as a, as a tech kind of problem. All right, so how have we tried to deal with this threat so far? So we've been talking about these cyber criminal marketplaces. What has been the, the approach up to this point? In terms of conventional law enforcement, the strategy has been conventional law enforcement tactics, which has been around takedowns and arrests. So if we think about how do we deal with crime, if you want to get to the photo, for instance, I showed you one just there of a Soto, you ultimately have to arrest the person to attribute exactly who they are, right? So that's been the, the core of the strategy, which is, okay, we try and arrest these people when we can. We also try and do takedowns. We try and hit the infrastructure. So that might be in, a, in relationship to these types of cyber criminal marketplaces. We try and take those marketplaces out in different ways, maybe twinned with an arrest strategy going on uh, together. Or if, if we're talking about botnets, we're trying to take out some of the botnet infrastructure. We're trying to hit uh, really the, the most sort of visible and obvious aspects of this, and we're trying to arrest the people involved. Now the problem becomes, how effective can we be in this? Particularly when we're talking about uh, cyber criminals based all across the world and sometimes based in jurisdictions where we don't have good relationships uh, between different countries, right? So we can think about the example of Russia if you're operating in, say, the US or the UK or somewhere else and you have a, a cyber criminal who's operating out of Russia, can you get good cooperation at this point in time if you're trying to make an arrest, if you're trying to get uh, that type of cooperation? Actually, the same would apply in Russia uh, in relation to, say, Kazakhstan or somewhere like that. So everyone faces a similar type of problem, which is this jurisdictional barrier that, that there is when you're trying to, to make a risk. So the question is, how much effectiveness can you have with this type of approach? The other part of it is, if you look at these types of takedowns of infrastructure, whether it's botnets or whether it's marketplaces, do the actors just move? So you hit a particular marketplace, you shut it down, they just set up a new one and off they go again. Or if you take out the botnet infrastructure, if you haven't taken out the people behind the botnet infrastructure, they're just going to set up a new infrastructure. So there's this kind of question about, is this sort of a whack-a-mole type of situation? Obviously, there's very strong reasons why law enforcement goes in that direction. But the question is, 
are there this issue of what we call displacement, which is displaces either in time, so people stop for a short period of time and they restart again, or it displaces in space, which is they move somewhere else and they or even move into a different type of activity. So that's something we need to be aware of. So part of the core of, of what we're trying to do with this project is understand are there other types of approaches we might adopt that are less uh, hammer-like, that are less strict, less strong, less conventional in terms of law enforcement? Are there softer and sometimes cheaper approaches in terms of not requiring a massive operation that crosses jurisdictions, that involves a huge amount of attribution, a huge amount of arrests, and these kind of things? So that's what we were kind of inspired by. And the, the question we asked is, can we play games of cyber criminals? In a sense, can we mess with the marketplaces? Can we inject some kind of distrust there? Uh, and how would we go about doing that? That was the core motivation that we adopted here. Is there something, not necessarily to replace these existing law enforcement, some strategy, but something you might supplement them with. And so that's what has been driving our work. OK, so this particular project has two questions, which is how do cybercriminal actors in online networks cooperate and trust each other? So we've talked about that question of trust quite a lot already. And then how can these networks be disrupted? So what were the methods that we used? And this is the part I mentioned as being slightly weird, so I'm going to try and introduce them to you because I'm not expecting uh, many of you to be experts in experimental economics. And as I mentioned, I'm not really an expert in experimental economics either. So I'm going to do my best to try and explain it to you in a way that people can understand, in a way that I tried to understand it myself. So this is actually the first time anyone's used this, this type of approach in relation to these markets, to my knowledge anyway. I'm willing to be corrected on that, of course. Uh, and so what we looked at was to design a market very similar to what we call a market for lemons game. So if you're not familiar with market for lemons is, if you think about a used car market, that is the most famous example, which is if you're selling used cars, uh, you know a lot more about the particular car or cars that you have. And if you're buying them, you don't. And you're in a bit of trouble because you have what's called an information asymmetry. So the seller maybe knows they're selling you a lemon. The buyer does not know, right? So you might think, OK, there's ways they can figure it out and things like this. But just on face value, in that interaction, one side has much more information than the others. And that's a very dangerous position to be in as the buyer, right? But it's also a dangerous position for the market, because the theory is that the market like that will collapse over time. It just won't work very well. And so we do just spiral down. Uh, so what we see here is the way out of that problem is things like reputation. So there's various mechanisms that have been developed over time to try and solve this problem. So we get like branding, licensing, regulation, and reputation is very, very important for trying to solve this type of problem. If people know that particular seller, that particular vendor is good, I trust them, I trust the product, then you're more likely to buy from them. The market won't collapse in the same kind of way. So there have been a number of Market for Lemons games that have been experimented with. And when I what I mean by that is experimental economics, what we're really talking about here is a type of game theory. But we're not talking about the highly mathematical or the modeling of the game theory. We're talking about getting humans to actually play games and see how they play them, see what shakes out. So what decisions they're actually making, rather than just trying to come up with a model of what decisions we think they would make. Right. So that's the point of this. So we took some of these off-the-shelf games, we looked at that, and then we built our own design to see how we would play around with this to, to get to the key interventions we were interested in, in, in studying. So I, I will, maybe it might be a bit of a letdown, but I'm going to say that we aimed at a broad kind of approach at first, because this is the first time we're trying to do this. One of the temptations we had, and it was a temptation I really, really strongly had, was to make this as, a, as realistic as possible, to like get everything you could find in terms of how cyber criminal markets look, like the ones I showed you, make something that looks like that, give them, you know, uh, you know, let's play this for six months, let's see how long you know, we can do this, let's track this for a really long time, all this kind of stuff, build in as much realism as possible. But I was cautioned, and correctly, I think, by those who had more expertise in the area, which was to be very, very careful about how much noise you built into the experiment, right? Which is the less uh, elements, the less variation, the more confidence you can have in that one particular variable, one particular factor is driving a, a change of one kind or another. So if you're trying to understand what interventions might succeed in, in making these markets work less efficiently, you want to have a, a high degree of confidence in terms of this is the only variable that we've changed, and there's not 15 others that we need to pay attention to. So that's what we did. Uh, and this, I view, very much as a, as a first step. And we're looking at ways that over time, in a much more coordinated way, of building in some of, some of these extra variables. Uh, so this built on, a, on an earlier attempt, a, a small pilot that we ran in, in a lab, where literally people sat in a room like a classroom and played this on computers. Uh, and then we moved into what I'm presenting to you today, which is an online experiment, where you can have people sitting at computers in their own home uh, playing the game. And this makes it much easier to recruit and to engage with far more participants than if you're just requiring everyone to turn up to a certain place. And it also means you can engage with different types of people as well. 
Okay, so the experimental design was basically broken down into a series of mini markets. So again, rather than going with, okay, there's a market with thousands of people in it, it was, okay, let's, let's build this up in terms of what we can have confidence in. So we ran these mini markets. So each group was basically one such market. So there's 56 of them. Each one had four sellers and three buyers. So ultimately, you're one of the buyers in there. You have a choice in each round to buy from one of the four. You've got some options there. They play this game over 20 rounds, so there's 20 potential transactions they can have if they want to buy and sell, and then we're going to watch how that, that uh, plays out, and ultimately there was 392 participants in this, in this experiment. So what we did was split them up into four sessions, so we call them treatments, but they're basically sessions, and in each of those uh, there was 14 groups. And so the idea here is rather than put all the interventions we're thinking about testing, just smash them together, which would lead to that type of noise I was talking about, you actually want to test them one by one. Right, and test them against what's effectively a control to see which ones are actually having the impact that you want or not. So that's how we, we went about structuring this. Uh, the participants in this particular phase are recruited from Amazon Mechanical Turk. Uh, if you're interested in why we did that and why you might do other things, I'm happy to discuss that in, in question time. But that's uh, one of the ways people engage, uh, one of the participant pools people use in these type of online experiments, but there are others as well. Okay, so this is what the game structure was. So this is the seller side. So you're a vendor, you're a cyber criminal vendor effectively, you're trying to sell a product. What is it that, what are the steps that you go through when you're in one of these mini markets? So you're one of the vendors in this group of seven, what do you do? So you had the option here of producing up to two goods, uh, two units of a good, and there was two types of goods. So you had regular goods, which we can view as the poorer ones, and then super goods, which are more valuable, they're, they're better ones. Those are the ones you really wanna buy, right? So they have the choice of saying, okay, I wanna, produce two super goods or two regular groups of goods or one of each. So not one of each, but just one regular or one super. You couldn't do one of each in this particular experiment or, or zero goods. And then they could advertise, but the ads did not have to be truthful. And that's where the, all this kind of deception comes in, which we see in, in real cyber criminal markets and what we're trying to understand whether we could push that deception more, get it ha happening at a higher level. So in this sense, you could advertise uh, in a completely untruthful way. So you could say that you are you know, selling two super goods, but you're really selling one regular good and things like this. So that's the, the key to this. The seller's production decision is private, so no one knows this other than that's the market for lemons part. And ultimately, they get a choice of how, how they want to price this. So they can price between one and 200 uh, points. And ultimately, the seller can default. So they can not produce a product. They can not send the product that someone buys. And that's uh, the worst thing that could happen to the buyer, is not only is a potentially a poor product, there's just no product that's provided. They buy the product, and the product does not come. OK. So this is what uh, it looks like in the interface. So this was coded in Otree, which has become a relatively standard uh, platform for doing these types of online experiments. And here you can see basically what I just outlined to you, which is the, the decisions that a, uh, a seller can make within this game. So they can produce none all the way up to producing two super goods. They then have the pricing option in terms of points. And then they can decide how they want to advertise and whether they want to advertise truthfully or whether they want to deceive in terms of uh, not being quite honest about what they are producing here. Okay, so this is the game from the buyer side. Now, as we mentioned in a Market for Lemons game, the buyer doesn't know very much, but they do know some things. So what they do know is the advertised quality. They know, you know, and so this is basically what the ad is. They know what the price is because that's also been advertised. They know in this game the identification letter of the seller, so they can track them over the course of a number of rounds. So they can say, oh, I know J, or I know A, or I know Z. I did business with them two rounds ago. That was a good interaction, so I'm going to go with them again. So they know that. And then they get some information, which we built in there to replicate the kind of reputation mechanism as it exists within cyber criminal marketplaces, which is effectively around uh, the average rating over the previous rounds, and uh, also the, the last three ratings. So you're getting some sense of a track record. You're getting some sense of um, what you want to know, really, uh, beyond knowing the actual product itself. You're knowing a little bit about the, the seller. OK, so they don't know the most important piece of information, which is what is the quality of the actual good that they're buying. And that's very, very important to them. So at the end of each round, that's the information that they learn. And then ultimately, the last and very important part of this is they then get to rate so they get to say whether they like the transaction. So whether they got the product that they wanted, so they paid for a super good, they got a super good, and they're gonna say maybe give it a, a high score, uh, five, or maybe they had a terrible interaction, they're gonna give it a one. So we know this is very familiar to how we do things on the internet, how we do things in life in terms of rating transactions. So this is the same thing, this is the way we're trying to capture reputation within this particular uh, game. <clears throat> 
So you can see here on the uh, purchasing side, so on the buyer side, what that decision looks like. It's, uh, again, you can see the options here in terms of the, the different products that are being advertised. You can see something about the, the ratings. So you can see the question marks there is because it's only trading round two, so that data doesn't exist yet. So the question marks are listed for those rounds that haven't occurred yet. And then you can see the average rating overall. So in this case, they've gone for a slightly risky option. So they've gone for the cheapest option because uh, it's 20 points and that's nice. But ultimately, uh, that person's average rating is one from the first round, so maybe we won't trust this person. But they've gone for it, so they've gone for a bit of risk uh, to see what they can get out of this. Okay, so what matters here, and it's a very important point, which is you actually get paid to play this game. Like, we paid people to play this game. It's very expensive to run these types of experiments. So I don't recommend it unless you've thought about it a lot, because uh, otherwise there are very costly mistakes that come into this. Uh, and that's why we have to think very hard about the design of this and about how much we're building into this, because it really means something when you blow the whole budget and then it's gone, because you can't actually repeat it if you don't have budget. So. What happens here is uh, people get paid to play the game and that creates an incentive. And so going back to the point about cyber criminals are people too, people like money, cyber criminals like money, we're just basing it off that, that core thing, which is if you're playing a game, you wanna make more money rather than less money. And so what we're talking about here is we said the participants are not cyber criminal participants. That's a variation you could build in later once we had more certainty about this game, try and find people uh, who maybe used to be former cyber criminals, as I'll talk about at the end of the presentation. Maybe there's ways of doing this out in the wild uh, where you could learn more about how this works in the real world. But ultimately for us, we were just going off the core profit motivation of the people who were participants in the game. And there's, these are people, as I mentioned, who, who were from MTurk. And so this is the business. This is how they earn money in a lot of cases, by doing tasks on MTurk. And so we provided them with one such task. Now, it's very important within experimental economics, not only do you pay people, but you pay them at minimum wage. So the idea here is that even if you're terrible at the game and you really lose quite badly, we still have to pay people minimum wage. Um, so that's, you know, you have to pay for the time that people are giving to the experiment. So there are things that you do in terms of kind of, in some sense, cleaning the participant pool of trying to make sure that you have a good group of participants before you recruit them. They do a survey, do some tasks. You're basically trying to uh, verify that you've got people who are taking this task seriously. So a lot of these elements are kind of go unseen, but they're very important in terms of how you go about doing this. So ultimately, that's the key. They get paid, uh, they get paid at least minimum wage, but if they play the game well, they get paid more than minimum wage, and that's the whole point. So they can earn more and more if they do more, uh, and, uh, but they're not going to earn like a million dollars because we did not have that in the budget, uh, but they're going to earn something, and they're going to earn a, a, good, a good wage for, for the amount of time that they're putting in. So ultimately, the payoffs then become built into the game. So the better you do with the game, the more you get paid. So here we can see how that works. So we have the, the production decision, which is basically on the, on the seller side. You want to advertise product. Uh, you want to produce that product. That product costs you something uh, to produce. And on the buyer side, it's worth something when, when you buy it. So we can see that the payoffs, the buyer payoff is the value of the received product, so the received good, minus the vendor's price. So if we go to, say, a regular good on the received good, that's worth 30. Uh, say the price was 20, so they make 10, right? So that's the idea. And on the seller side, the payoff is sales revenue minus the cost of production. So say, again, we go to a regular good, they advertise it for 20, it's, the cost is 10, they make 10, right? But you can see they can go endlessly in different directions in terms of how they do this. The way that then converts into real world money uh, is that 100 points equals $2. Uh, there's more complexity in terms of the payment structure and how this all works, which I'm happy to talk about if you want, but that's the, the core of it. Uh, and you can see there that obviously there's a gap between the cost and the value, and the point of that, that's the economics, right? People deciding how they make money, whether they're gonna be in this case, uh, making money as a seller, that game looks different than if you're making money as a buyer. So you don't get to choose, you assign these roles, but you can see the, the payoffs and the calculations are different uh, in that respect. Okay, so now we get to the, the interventions, which is what we're actually trying to do uh, to mess with these markets. So this is the, the games we're trying to play with, with these uh, people. And so what we did here was take uh, from the existing literature, so people had written about how would we disrupt marketplaces in terms of injecting distrust. What are the particular tactics we would use to do that? And so that's where we tried to draw those from to test what had been talked about conceptually, but hadn't actually been tested in, in any way, really. So that's what we did. So we took, and I'll explain them in a second, the slander attack and the Sybil attack were the two that had been discussed most widely in the, in the literature. Uh, we could talk about others, and actually we're very keen to explore others. So these, as we'll go through the presentation, we might think are not particularly good attacks for different reasons. Uh, but this is the ones, the ones that have been talked about. So before I get into that, 
we had a baseline, which is basically a control, which we have no intervention. So we talked about these different sessions, these different treatments where we ran. So one of them runs with no intervention whatsoever. So it's the game as I, as I mapped it out. They play the game, and that's it. Uh, there's no intervention on, it, on our behalf. Then we get into the three other treatments, the three other sessions where we make those interventions happen, but we do them one by one. So instead of, as I mentioned, just grouping them all together, uh, we split them out. So the first one is the, the slander attack. So that, in the literature, is talked about as basically what you might expect it to be. Uh, if you're a buyer, uh, you, know, you, you buy a product and then you just start slandering the, the seller. So if they sell you a good quality product, you say it's terrible. Uh, or you could do the other way around as well, depending on what type of, uh, Sort of deception you're trying to create. But the idea there is it's really like a buyer side attack. You're trying to hit the reputation of sellers by providing inaccurate information. So in our experiment, what we did was add a 20% probability that each rating from a buyer was replaced with a different random rating. So uh, they are doing, going through this process, as I mentioned, the last step as, as the buyer is you rate the transaction once it's gone through. So we're providing that extra added bit of noise in terms of ruining some of those ratings. So we're making those ratings not what they were put in to be originally. The civil attack's a little bit more complicated. Uh, in its purest form, it's really the idea of undercover agents coming into a market and then really trying to flood that market with poor quality product or defaulting much higher rates. Uh, there's more an external type of version of that as well, which would be trying to intercede in certain ways. So the transactions are happening, you're kind of outside in some sense, but if you can put yourself between them and cut off those interactions, cut off the transactions. So it's easier to examine that in a more physical sense. If someone sends a package and that package is intercepted, then you can block that transaction, right? So the, the receiver may not know why that package uh, didn't come, but they will know, uh, you know, but they will suspect and they will have maybe negative feelings about the seller as a result of that. So the Sybil attack in our experiment was adding a 20% probability that each good did not arrive independent of the seller's decision. And what I mean by that is that the seller can default, as we talked about. So the seller might be ripping them off anyway. So we're just increasing the likelihood of that default, of there being no product that's provided. So they buy the product and nothing comes, which is a fairly common scam that some cyber criminals carry out against victims, but also against other, other cyber criminals. And then at the end here, we have the combined treatment, which I mentioned before about not wanting to create noise, but here we're actually trying to do it in a more systematic way of, of intentionally putting them together, having separated them. And so the idea here is we want to see if there's interaction between these two tactics. If you put in the two interventions at the same time, will it actually create something else that doesn't happen if you just have each of them on their own? So that's the... Uh, the basic design in terms of, of the interventions. We're taking what has been discussed within the academic literature and we're trying to understand how that might play out to test it to see if they work or not. Maybe they work, maybe they don't. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through here some uh, key findings. I'm not going to walk you through this table, uh, but that's a, an illustration of, of some of the, the underlying work, of which there's much more, but I'm just going to pull out some of the, the key takeaways for you that uh, may be of interest here. So, out of these different interventions that we looked at, the civil attack reduces seller earnings by 43%, uh, which is quite substantial. And it actually gets more substantial than that, which is in the last 10 rounds, it, it decreases uh, these seller earnings by 63%. Uh, so what we're seeing there is quite useful and interesting because what we look for in these types of experiments is basically what's known as a learning effect. And so you think, okay, over the first part of the experiment, people are trying to figure out how to play the game, how it works, how they're going to do it well. In the second 10 rounds, the last 10 rounds, they've learned the lessons. And so what you're seeing there is the behavior that's been impacted by the types of interventions that you've made. So in this case, what we see there is the Sybil intervention had quite a profound impact, particularly in the second half of the experiment. Uh, which is nice to see in terms of looking for something. And if we're thinking about we're trying to disrupt the business of cybercrime in some sense, uh, by looking at disrupting the earnings, that is the core reason that profit-driven cybercriminals are involved in this, that's a pretty nice thing to be achieving. So that's potentially positive. I'll get in discussion a little bit some of the complexities around that, but that's a potentially interesting finding. Now, we looked at what a number of sub-findings that kind of connected to this core finding. And so one of them is around the increase in buyer inactivity. So we actually saw that this means basically buyers are not buying as much. So they get discouraged and they stop purchasing as many products. And so what we see there is actually across all the treatments, these three, three interventions, we saw some impact there. But particularly within the, the Sybil and also combined, we saw that uh, inactivity increasing by 15%, which is quite substantial. And so we think that that is actually what's driving uh, this loss of, of, uh, of earnings. And I'll show you a figure in the next slide which will map this out in a little bit more uh, detail and clarity. So overall, uh, what we saw there, this third finding is the civil attack reduces the proportion of regular goods purchased. So it was quite surprising to us 
we, we talked about the super goods being the better quality goods and then these regular goods being the kind of average or worst quality goods if there's only two types, uh, was that the super good market actually held quite strongly. So people didn't flee from that market. It seems almost as if they stopped trading as much, they stopped buying as much of these regular goods, but if they were going to buy, they wanted to stick with the ones that they knew may be better quality. It's almost as if the risk of possibly getting a better payoff was driving this type of activity. So. Uh, what we saw across these three findings and in general was that the Sybil attack was the one that we had uh, the, the clearest results for. The combined intervention actually had almost as good results. Uh, but what's interesting about that is they were not better uh, and they were not substantially different in a number of ways. So if you're going to invest in a particular intervention, you go with the cheaper one, which is just the single Sybil. There's no reason to put the slander and the Sybil together because that's just going to cost you more in terms of resources if one's basically achieving the same thing, and pretty much is, actually. Uh, the fourth finding there is the slander attack appeared to have uh, only limited effect. So uh, that means, effectively, if you're looking at this particular study, and I'll caution you in a moment when we get onto the discussion to look at this in maybe a slightly different way, uh, it would look as if the slander attack doesn't work at all. It certainly didn't work in this experiment. Uh, we, we didn't really have any, uh, any findings of note that we'd stand behind in terms of, of, of statistical significance. So uh, that would be the, the core kind of takeaways of what you would uh, see here in relation to these key findings. The Sybil attack looks like the, the winner uh, in terms of this particular experiment. So what we can see here is just an illustration of this uh, to make it a little, a little clearer. So on the left-hand side, we have the seller earnings. So you can see there the, the blue line on the far left is the baseline, the control. The gray one is the Sybil intervention. So we can see that big drop in seller earnings. Um, and we can see that for both the, the combined but, but more for the, for the Sybil. And so this kind of illustrates a little bit why that narrative about why those earnings drop, so why cyber criminals are earning less, why people in this marketplace are earning less. Uh, and so what we're seeing here is that's tied to this, this drop in revenue. So basically they're not selling as much. But the key part of that is that the production costs don't drop. So what we're seeing on the, on the buyer side is they're not buying as much, but on the seller side, they're still trying to produce, they're still trying to play a role within this market. They don't just give up. Uh, so the buyers are the ones that kind of start to give up a little bit, but the sellers are still trying. Uh, and so that's quite interesting. So this, uh, this figure kind of explains a little bit uh, what we're talking about in terms of that particular narrative uh, of, of what's driving that, that drop in seller earnings, so we can understand that a little bit more. Okay, so to bring you on to a discussion a little bit, how do we put this into context? How do we make sense of this more broadly in terms of understanding this particular experiment and more broadly in terms of understanding disruption activities against cyber criminal marketplaces, trying to understand how we can kind of mess with this type of ecosystem? I think the broad takeaway from this uh, is that there's potential value here. So this is still very early days. As I mentioned, it's the first time we've tried to do something like this. Uh, it's something that uh, needs to be explored in much greater detail. But the early suggestions are there seems to be some value, some impact in terms of these types of softer tactics, these types of uh, less uh, intensive uh, approaches that are really about the economic manipulation of some of these markets. So we see value in that, and we see that in particular ways. So the, the data particularly supports the Sybil attack, as we talked about. But the caution I would give you here is that this is, as I mentioned, just one specific experimental design. And what you really need to do is not only replicate, but actually start to build in greater variation over time. And so one of the points of variation, which we realized after we did the experiment, was that the Sybil attack can be designed in a number of different ways. So we designed it as a market-wide type of intervention, right? So for both of these particular interventions, they're hitting across the market. Uh, and so it can hit potentially any, any vendor or any, any uh, buyer, depending on the, the attack in question. So what we're talking about here is specific ways that they can be played out. So if we think about a different type of slander attack, it might be one that's much more targeted. So you may pick particular high value, sort of high end vendors, say, OK, we don't need to hit all the vendors within this market. These are the top five. These are the ones that are the best at this. So let's try and slander them. And so that's something that could be tested further, to look at that more targeted type of approach, which is a more kind of uh, better value in approach as well, in terms of where you put your resources, where you hit those targets, uh, rather than going across a whole market. And that brings us to this other point, which is there are certain practicalities here around the implementation of these. So we can look at what the impact of different in interventions will be, whether they're worth investigating at all, right? So we can say the civil attack is worth investigating. But when it comes to a practical implementation, there may be challenges around that. There may be resource costs around that as well. So that's something to think about. So if you ask me before the experiment, 
and this is why, you know, in terms of science, things can happen as they happen. I would have much preferred if the, if the slander attack had come out on top because it's much easier to put out into the field. Uh, you know, if you think about the way law enforcement works, not just in cybercrime, but in general, you know, one of the common ways that you infiltrate markets or that you play the, play the game in some sense is as a buyer because it's much easier to get into a market like that. It's much easier to kind of commit a low-level form of criminality or to pretend to do so uh, coming at that buyer side. And it's just much simpler than trying to either get up really high within a market Market as a vendor, as a trusted vendor, and then try and inject distrust at that level. You can do it, but that takes much more time. Or, you know, that more external type of attack, uh, which is complicated in a different kind of way. So what we can see here is we have to think about, um, you know, it's good to know that there's potential value in this type of approach. It's good to know which interventions may work, but the practical impl implementation is key. And we can't go uh, further without really knowing more about that kind of thing. So on top of that, uh, we may also explore different types of of these types of interventions. So as I mentioned, we, we chose two that have been talked about a lot uh, already conceptually, but hadn't been tested. But there might be others that haven't been talked about as much. There might be others that people have in this room. And I'm very open to suggestions about how to engage in this type of uh, research, and what may work, what injects distrust. Uh, these are the ideas that have been discussed. These are the ones that we tested. But ultimately, there are others that we might want to think about as well. So, uh, and the, the last point there is about multiple markets. So one of, the, one of the issues I raised earlier is about this issue of displacement which is if you are arresting or doing takedowns, do you just displace that type of cyber criminal activity somewhere else? The same question might arise here, right? So you need to think about, you may be successful in disrupting a particular marketplace, but will some of the, the actors in that marketplace simply just move to another one? So they realize this is not a great market. You've successfully disrupted this market. I don't, so, so badly, I don't want to be here anymore, and I'm going to go to that market, right? So we need to think about the broader kind of game. It's a much bigger game, uh, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger uh, as, as you go along. So there are, there are a lot of nuances here that we need to consider in terms of practical application. OK, uh, the last point here is on future directions. So as I've sort of alluded to already, we're very keen to think about this, uh, not just as an intellectual exercise, but also how this would have real world impact, right? So uh, how do you get sort of real world action against real world cyber criminals, uh, move out from this kind of uh, very sort of uh, space that's scientific and kind of testing things out into real world application? How do you design things in a way uh, that may aid that? So we've already had a lot of very positive discussions with law enforcement, uh, particularly in Europe and the UK. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, input fed into some of the designs we've had, some of the discussions we've had up to this point already. But that's an angle that we need to think about going forward in terms of not just the real world design and how to make these types of experiments very accurate, but also in terms of implementation. Uh, different individuals, different units within law enforcement, and also industry more broadly, may look to actually start to roll out some of these disruptive ideas. Some of them are doing this already in different ways. So uh, we'd need to, to kind of think about how to build this research out uh, into something that, that can be of use to, to, to practitioners and ways in which it's very, very policy relevant and, and relevant to the real world. So that engagement is, is very key and ultimately sort of look at this question of how do you uh, best disrupt cyber criminal markets in the wild? So not just do it in this very controlled setting, which has its, its reasons for why it's so controlled and why we can say things with, with greater degree of confidence. But ultimately, the real world application is key and that's where this has to head in the end. So we're very keen to, very open to, to any suggestions in that kind of space. All right, so just to, to finish, uh, you're welcome to, to get in touch with me if you want. And just a very quick thank you to Cisco Research, who basically provided uh, the funding for, for this research. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, we couldn't have done it without that funding. And we're very grateful that they provide this sort of independent academic uh, research funding for projects like this uh, so that we can carry out this type of research. Uh, and that's uh, very much appreciated. So on that note, I'm happy to open it up to any questions. And uh, please let me know if there's anything you want to hear more about. Geo, um, that had a huge impact on our study afterwards, like really massive. Just FYI. 
Um, but with the civil attack, I'm wondering if you have any concrete ideas about how that could be. Like, I'm not clear uh, how, because I'm assuming in your, I don't want a clarification in your game, like, did you actually disrupt, you just intervened in the engine, the game engine level to cause a civil attack. So I'm wondering what a real world strategy would be for executing a civil attack like that. I mean, it's a good question, because I'm also wondering, uh, <laughs> which is <laughs> basically, as I was saying, that the, the end point is, is how to kind of engage further with that, that type of thing, because I think it's, it's a very real question. Uh, so a, as you've pointed out, I think you're correct that we're intervening in a certain kind of way, which appears to be external. So in some sense, you could say it looks more like that external type of intervention of this kind of interdiction. Uh, another way, it depends on how you look at it, um, that you can also think of it as, as we're just sort of trying to model, in some sense, what it might look like if there was an internal attack. But the other way of doing that within experimental design is to actually have people acting as these kind of rogue agents. So again, that's another kind of point of variation you can build in, which is to have uh, specific undercover agents that are either, you know, you control them or they're tasked with that role as part of the function that they do these sort of activities from time to time. So you could build in a little more detail. And as I said, this is the first step you could start building in to try and understand more that difference between the internal and the, the external. Uh, in terms of the real world thing, I mean, that's, that's the challenge, right? So as I mentioned, I used the example of the, of the physical packages. So if we're talking about like a drug market or something like this, I mean, that we know that exists, right? That there are uh, packages that get stopped for, for different reasons by different agencies. Uh, and so that's one way that we know occurs. The question is, how do you do that in more cyber terms, right? That's a much more difficult question. And actually, that's a question as, as someone who's a, not a technologist in a, in a meaningful way. I'm curious uh, as to whether people have ideas about whether that is possible in, in cyber terms. Uh, so uh, the other way, I mean, we know in terms of uh, the, the origin of the civil attack, the way it's been talked about, you know, undercover agents, if you build up a, an identity over a long period of time, that identity can do whatever you want it to do, right? So that identity, as we know from past cases, can be used to carry out large-scale operations that lead to arrests. It can be used to inject a degree of distrust. Uh, so that's the question is, uh, that would be the model of what we'd expect to see. But the problem with that is the amount of investment required um, to build up that kind of identity uh, over time. So I should say when I go back, as I mentioned, we took these two attacks out of the existing literature. It's not necessarily an endorsement to say, uh, you know, we want this to, to be the way it should be. It's more this was talked about, we're then testing it. And the point I made is, you know, the practical application is the next test to it. Uh, so you need to know, does it do anything at all? Because if it doesn't do anything in a controlled setting, there's absolutely no point. Uh, investigating in a real world setting. But if you at least know that it does something in a controlled setting, then you can look at the, the practical application, which is which is the next step. But I'm very, very eager if, if there are other suggestions on, on that application side uh, to get that, that realism built in more. Uh, so on the slander attack, so it appears that you can use 20% of the time you randomly replace the score to a random score. So it's possible that it could have been a negative score that got replaced with a positive score. But in a true slander attack, you would only go to the negative side, never the positive side. So they didn't think that it introduced noise that they made the slander attack less effective? So, I mean, it depends. So you, you may have a view of the slander attack that it is purely about, you know, that idea of, of saying, okay, they're doing good quality trade and you're going to say it's terrible. Uh, so if you want to be a, a purist about it, you may say, well, that's, that's that. So, um, yeah, basically what that means in terms of the design is you could then replicate. So we talked about altering the way the slander attack is implemented. One way of doing that is making it more targeted. The other way is what you're talking about, which is to just say, we just want to look at the, the high ratings and then compromise those uh, rather than sort of scramble randomly. So in some sense, as I said, because it was a first step, we're just trying to figure this out. Honestly, the lab version that occurred before this, we were really trying to figure this out. Because when you're doing something for the first time, there's a lot of things you've got to learn how to do. Um, so. That, that's correct. I wouldn't necessarily say um, that we introduced noise. I'd more say that we, we modeled one type of attack that involves compromising any rating to a, to a random rating. And you could look at a more kind of specific attack that looks just at the highest ratings and then trying to compromise those to the, to the lowest. But it's, a, it's an absolute fair point. Again, looking at the impl implementation and looking at what are the types of variations you would want to look at to see how, how effectively you can make this work. Well, I mean, you might, because if that person's selling terrible product, and then you make a whole bunch of people buy terrible product, uh, that's not bad. Actually, that might be better. We don't know, right? So we could do the, the opposite of that and look for all the worst ratings and push them up to fives. May who knows? I mean, it's one of these things where people often say, you know, you, you do research or, or like this or something else, and people say, well, isn't that finding obvious? 
But the point is that sometimes, one, scientifically, you need to prove things are obvious are true. And then the other time is sometimes things are not as obvious as you think they are. Uh, so that, that's a, an interesting point, which is there's a lot of different options that you could take in terms of the slander attack and what direction you take it in. But yeah, I think that's, a, that's an interesting point. <laughs> I like qualitative questions because I'm a qualitative researcher. <laughs> So do you mean how, how generalizable do you think this type of market is to a ransomware market as opposed to, say, a carding market or something else? Oh, no, no, not even generalizable. Just um, asking, uh, does it match with where you, your perception of the actual artist has been going in the last Yeah, so I mean, one of the problems is that uh, there are some ransomware actors who don't, well, let me take a step back. Uh, the concept of markets is broader than the concept of a marketplace. Uh, so the concept of markets are really about trading, right? So you can have a market, which is just a few people, uh, or you can have a marketplace, which is this formal location, either online or offline, people go to. So uh, the issue with some ransomware actors is that a lot of them are not on the formal marketplaces, some of the top ones. So, um, you know, we hear this term like crime as a service or malware as a service or ransomware as a service. So the origin of that term was really about marketplaces. And now the reality of ransomware groups and some of the other malware groups is much more like a series of partnerships. Uh, and often people people working with each other who've known each other for a long period of time uh, and not engaging with strangers on marketplaces, right? So again, it depends where you're looking. Uh, so in some sense, yeah, if you're looking at, that would be another key point of variation, right? So if you're trying to inject trust, you'd have to look at that type of business model in a, in a different way than one that's looking at a kind of broader marketplace business model. Uh, so that application would, would differ because I think what you're speaking about there is tighter trust groupings in some sense, more longer term relationships, and less about uh, finding people on an open marketplace. Uh, very much so. So the interpretation really from that is that um, by going for that high value products, we're almost introducing the idea of a prestige product into the market. Right. So that, and we're also um, creating in some sense a monopoly uh, with the most trusted actors, and therefore we're also um, increasing the barrier to entry for new actors yeah, I mean, those are all good points. Uh, so there were certain things we actually did with this design to reduce the amount of uh, monopolization that could occur. But that's another point that could be looked at. Uh, and particularly when you're looking at, uh, as we mentioned about, say, the slander attack and trying to hit those high value uh, vendors, uh, if we're really looking at like tracking that side of things and looking at the more kind of high level prestige stuff or the, or the really attractive type of products, the really attractive type of vendors, that's the direction you could go in. Uh, but I still think there's a difference between uh, that and some of these groups and these networks that are just operating in a, in a very different way, more in a firm-like way or in a part, more a partnership way between firms and individuals and less in a, in a core marketplace. But the marketplaces certainly haven't gone away and they're certainly not irrelevant. It's just, again, uh, the application of what, what are you trying to apply it to? What are you speaking about? What part of the cyber criminal industry, the under, underground, is, is enormous and highly specialized? So we need to find where we're looking, uh, even when we have some of these very general principles that we might think about applying. But yeah, very, very good points. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. And uh, that's the end of our time here. If you have further questions, please reach out to them or follow up outside. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks a lot.